Hi, um, I'm Kyle. I'm an iOS engineer on the Register team here. Um, I mostly work on core frameworks. Um, and I'm here today to talk about the design and architecture of Register. Um, so a little bit about the Register app. Um, we have 18 iOS engineers. Um, it's around 18. Some are half server and not half iOS, but it rounds out to about there. Um, we ship a major release every month. And then every two weeks after that, we ship um, a minor release, which bug fixes, improvements, various small features, et cetera. Um, the Register app is built with 31 internal and 13 external frameworks. Um, I'm only going to cover a few of these today, um, which are Square Data, Square Core, um, and the hardware service. Um, first thing I want to talk about is validating key paths and selectors at compile time. Um, so why do you want to do this? Um, well, any code you can't validate at compile time is a liability. Um, as the code base grows, it becomes very important that you um, lean on the compiler as much as possible. Um, a single mistyped key path or selector can crash your app when it's in the hands of a customer, and that's not something you want. Wouldn't it be really great if we could validate these at compile time? Um, so we build a solution to that, um, and it's called SQ Key Path. You can see an example of use of it here. Um, and basically, it just replaces the use of an NS string when you're referencing a key path. So you can see here we have a key path macro that takes in a person, and then also a typed key path macro that takes in a, a class. Um, this can validate any type of key path that's specified as a property or a method. It obviously cannot validate key paths like min, max, and at count. So how does this work? Um, as you can see, um, it's just a macro, um, and it's broken down here into four parts. The bottom part is the most important part. Um, there's a cool GCC extension that LVM also supports, wherein bracket extensions, bracketed extensions will return their last statement as their value. Um, then back at the top, we have an if no, which ensures the inner code is never actually run. Um, the second line there is the most important part, and that's the code that actually performs the compile time check. Um, the third line down there is just the macro magic that essentially turns key path into a string, and then uh, prefixing that with an at symbol just turns it into an NS string. Um, so an example of where this becomes very powerful um, is when you're using uh, a key path with a collection, say an array. So here we have the person controller um, that has a method called all person names. Um, as you can see in the first line there, um, if you were to use just a normal string, um, if you mistyped name or name went away or was refactored, um, you would never get a compile time warning or error. Um, on the second line, as you can see, um, since we're using SQ type key path and you're passing in a class, um, you'll now get a compile time error or warning when that key path goes away. Um, again, very powerful for things like collections where you know the type. Um, another place where this is very useful um, is for the key paths for values affecting series of APIs. Um, instead of relying on key paths for values affecting name and job title existing, um, you can use the uh, version of the method that passes in all key paths, and then you continue using SQ type key path within there. Um, again, anytime any of these key paths go away or they're mistyped, um, you'll get a compile time warning, and it's much easier to track down bugs this way. Next, I want to talk about our hardware integration. Um, so Register supports a lot of hardware. We support 10 receipt printers, one ticket printer, uh, four cache drawers, eight barcode scanners, four square card readers, and square stand. Um, these communications are done over six interfaces, which is 30-pin, audio jack, Bluetooth, lightning, USB, um, and Wi-Fi. Um, our challenge is how do we unify these all in all, all these disparate configurations into a single interface that the app talks to? Um, when you want to print a receipt or a barcode, or scan a barcode, or swipe a card, uh, the responders or callers should not care about underlying implementation details. Basically, the app code should be talking to one API and one API only. Um, so to do this, we built Hardware Service. And Hardware Service is a framework that wraps separate hardware APIs um, and provides a unified interface for interacting with them. Um, all app-level communication is done with the Hardware Service. We'll never talk to a um, lower-level peripheral directly. Um, so we expose some primitives. We expose HQ peripheral, which is the superclass. Um, and then we have HQ card reader, stand, printer, and barcode scanner. Um, again, these are the only classes that the app will interact with. Um, so under the hood, each peripheral type is actually a class cluster. Um, this means that under the hood, there's things like HQ star network printer, HQ star Bluetooth printer, HQ stand cache drawer, um, et cetera. Again, the Apple level code isn't concerned with any of these subclasses. Um, they just talk to the superclasses directly. Um, each peripheral is actually an NS managed object under the hood. Um, this seems slightly weird, but it lets us do fancy and easy things, like having a fetch results controller that shows all connected peripherals, and it makes it easy to update UIs when they appear and disappear and update, all that sort of stuff. Um, each peripheral is managed by controller plus listeners. There's a controller 
per peripheral type and a listener per peripheral type plus interface type. Um, so for example, you'd have a printer listener and then you'd have a Wi-Fi printer listener, a Bluetooth printer listener, et cetera. Um, it's the listener and the controller's job to watch for changes um, and notify the rest of the system about added and removed peripherals or change peripherals. Um, once these changes are noticed, they're put into an event queue whose job it is to smooth bumps such as connection errors. Um, it also batches up updates, so if three peripherals connect in a short period of time, we show the user one HUD instead of three. Um, the other thing that this does is if a printer is rapidly connecting and disconnecting, um, but eventually ends up reconnecting, we won't show this to the user. Um, and that's it for hardware. Um, so as you may have guessed, um, at Square, we really love using core data. We use it for absolutely everything in our app. Um, but the APIs can be a little bit rough. Um, so we built a framework called Square Data. Um, and the job of Square Data is to make core data easy. Um, it essentially makes the APIs easier to understand and more approachable, um, especially to engineers who are not experts in core data. Um, it makes it difficult to shoot yourself in the foot, and it provides early warnings if you make a mistake. Um, an example of this type of API is the threading API we introduced to perform block and background queue. Um, so again, it's a very common core data pitfall that it's difficult to synchronize work done across background queues of background contexts. Background contexts. Um, the perform block and background queue API makes that easy. Um, so how do you use it? Um, essentially, under the hood, each managed object context owns a serial queue um, that contains the blocks of work enqueued with perform block and background queue. Um, you provide two blocks to the API, the work block and the completion block. Um, the work block is run on a background queue, and each, each block is provided its own uh, background managed object context. Um, once this work is done, it's saved, the changes are merged back into the main context, and the completion block is called. Um, you can call this API from any series of threads, um, and it will work and properly serialize all the work into one queue so you don't end up with competing, uh, competing contexts fighting over the same data. Um, Another example of where you can use this um, is the perform blocking background queue on background instance um, API that's on NS Manage object. This simply wraps the context level API and provides a background instance of the version of the object. Um, so in this example, um, we're updating a merchant um, on the background thread and we're fetching all of the payments that belong to that merchant. Um, nothing else too exciting about that. It just makes background work much simpler. Um, another thing that we've improved is setting up core data stacks. Um, it's usually very time consuming and manual, um, and there's a lot of places where you can mess it up. Um, Register has 18 separate core data stacks, so we really wanted to make this easier. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of pieces you have to set up. There's persistent stores, persistent store coordinators, managed object models, managed object context, mapping models, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this can get really difficult to get right in a multi threaded environment, especially when you're dealing with things like memoization for the managed object model, the context, the persistent store, et cetera. Um, so this is the API of the data store controller. Um, and there's two methods here that are bolded, um, managed object model paths and persistent store paths. Um, these are really the only two things that you'll, you need to override to create a new data store controller. Um, managed object model paths obviously provides the path to the managed object model, um, and persistent store path just provides the path to the persistent store. Um, th and essentially, once you've overridden those two things, you're up and running with a core data stack. Um, there are other methods here that you can obviously override if you need more control. You can override did load main manage object context if you need to perform some sort of customization to the context. Um, you can override load the custom entities methods um, if you need to do entity customization at runtime. We use this since we're merging multiple models together at runtime and we want to mark one set of uh, models as abstract. Um, there's other APIs such as should delete persistent store between application versions, which lets you delete the persistent store when updating your app. Um, because in some cases for us, it's faster to re-download all the data than run the migration locally. Um, you can also allow um, inferred migrations if you want to, um, and you can also exclude persistent stores from backup. This is important for us because we need to exclude things such as offline payments from backups because of PCI requirements. Um, there's another method called reset, reset persisted data, which lets you reset data in the store um, before anyone else can use it. Um, there's also options to provide a migration manager class if you want to run custom migrations, um, and also lifecycle management, so you can provide fetch requests to delete for given state, states of the application. Um, another thing that Square Data provides is services. And services essentially let you declare dependencies between groups of core data stacks and their associated model controllers. Um, it doesn't allow dependencies to be spun down um, until all of their dependent, if all of their dependents are still loaded. Um, as I mentioned, um, Register has 18 unique core data stacks that all need to communicate and depend on each other. Um, 
So basically, services make this much simpler. Um, you can basically think of services as an uh, alternative to singletons. Rather than having 18 singletons, um, you essentially have services that spin up and spin down as their dependencies are required and not required. Um, here's an example of a service. This is actually the hardware service that we discussed earlier. Um, so as you can see, it has the data store controller plus the model controllers. Um, and again, this is spun up um, after the account, after the Square account logs in, in our case, um, and spun down after that. This also solves various issues if you don't have hardware attempting to connect and disconnect um, while you're logged out of a register account because like, the service and all the model controllers around it simply don't exist and are not initialized. Um, next is fetch validation. Um, so fetch validation provides an easy way to validate that a fetch request can be run, run against a given SQLite store. Um, this was a very recent addition to Square Data um, because it, we needed to automate a previously manual process where when you wrote a fetch request or a predicate, you'd have to verify that each key path in the predicate um, existed and was modeled um, in, the man, in the managed object uh, model. Um, we, this already helped us catch one P0 bug in the first few days it was deployed, um, which is great. Um, under the hood, it works by inspecting the key path on NS sort descriptor um, and the key paths on the inner N expression and inner NS expressions of the NS comparison predicates um, within your predicates. Um, it's built to support any store type, so if you have a custom store, you can easily um, write your own validators for it. Um, and SD managed object context also overrides um, count for fetch request and execute fetch request um, to perform validation and debug builds. So even if you forget to write a test against your fetch requests, um, you'll still catch them when your application runs. Um, so this is the API that it presents. It's very simple. Um, there's essentially three versions of the same method. Um, you can check if the fetch can be performed against given stores, store types, or store classes. Um, and this is an example of how you'd use it. This is actually a unit test from Square Data. Um, as you can see, we're trying to perform a fetch um, that validates that all that, valid, or that fetches all products whose base amount, dot dollar amount, is greater than zero. So basically all products in your system that have a price. Um, it also tries to sort based on this key path, so we're sorting in ascending order based on the dollar amount. Um, you can see we're then asking the fetch request if it can perform against the given store types, which is SQLite. Um, if you look at the bottom, you can see that when you actually ask if we can perform these fetch request, or this fetch request, um, we get an error back saying the base amount and the dollar amount um, can't be sorted on and can't be predicated on. Um, if you're using, if you didn't have this, um, the fetch may succeed or it may fail or it may crash at runtime depending on if your objects are faulted or not. Um, so it's great to have an actual deterministic way of determining this. Um, it's also great because if you're developing in the simulator, um, you may not even know that your fetch request isn't valid because again, all of your objects will usually be in memory and not faulted. Um, some other things that Square Data does to make, uh, to make things simpler and smooth them, sharp edges, um, is we hide entities from the developer. Um, so obviously Core Data has the differentiation between an entity um, and a class. You specify the entity name um, in the managed object model, um, and the class is obviously specified in your code. Um, there's no real need for us to have this distinction. So essentially with Square Data, you never refer to an entity directly. You only ever refer to its class, and we do the lookup under the hood. Um, this is also nice because it removes more stringly typed code, so you're not looking up by entity name, you're looking up by class. Um, we have finder create based on unique values or dictionaries, um, because essentially, usually when you're processing um, API responses, you have to do the usual, like, does this object exist? Okay, get it, or does this object exist? No, create it. Um, we turn this into a one-liner um, via the objects of class APIs. Um, easy migrations are another thing that we're doing that essentially lets you provide migrations from one version of the app uh, from one version of the app to the other, um, and it will basically figure out how to map these automatically so you don't have to write a superset of migrations. Um, another um, example is the persistent queue, which is essentially like an NS operation queue, but it's persisted. Um, we use this to synchronize work that needs to be submitted to the server, such as um, transaction details. Um, finally, we have the managed object observer, um, which is you can essentially think of as a fetch results controller, but for a single object. Um, you can provide it an object, and it will call your delegate when, it's, uh, cre when the object's created or when it's deleted. Um, that's it for uh, Square Data. This is some of the stuff that we're thinking about in the future. Um, so MVVM, for those of you that don't know, is model view, view model. Um, and it's essentially a riff on the traditional MVC. Um, it essentially introduces a third 
I guess, fourth component called the view model, which is essentially a bespoke one-off model that represents the state of your view. Um, the reason we're investigating this is it will allow us to do headless testing against customer-facing flows rather than having to do slow integration tests. So rather than having to spend 20 minutes simulating um, a user walking through a set of views, um, we can simply walk through the models backing them instead, um, and that makes integration testing much faster. Um, again, it simply defines a model layer for view interactions. So imagine if you had a view um, that had a single text field and a button, um, your view model would essentially only expose those two primitives, um, and it would, under the hood, talk to the larger, more complicated model. Um, another benefit is it reduces your views to simple layout code and your view controllers to almost nothing but setting up bindings. So traditionally, you would have a view controller listen for target actions on views, assign those values back to models, um, and listen for changes to models and assign those changes back to views. Um, Again, with, with MVVM, um, we introduce bindings, which basically let your view model um, and view talk to each other directly, um, and then your model talk to your view model through a set of bindings. Um, so you can write these bindings, you can unit test them and make sure they work. Um, then you don't have to have one-off methods and target action pairings um, in all your view controllers. Uh, another thing that we're investigating um, is the state machine, is this something we call the state machine framework, um, which essentially models all storyboard-like flows um, in a state machine that should be fully unit testable and verifiable. Um, one thing that really sucks about uh, storyboards is it's really hard to unit test and ver validate at compile time that all, or even test time, that all of the paths through them are valid. Um, so this is one thing that we're trying to invest, uh, investigate, or invest in with the state machine framework. Um, finally, one that's not that exciting but has been very useful um, is we're moving towards composition for all of our very complicated objects instead of subclassing or simply hiding methods in categories. Um, an example of, why, of where we're doing this is our main transaction object that powers the register payment flow. Rather than throwing a bunch of methods in separate categories or just on the main class itself, um, we're essentially breaking uh, functionality out into things we call handlers. So you have a handler for line items, a handler for fees, taxes, etc. Um, and we found this has been very useful for breaking functionality into part or breaking functionality apart into ways. Uh, ways that ensure that you're writing code that's more testable um, and more compartmentalized. Um, so that's all I have for you. Thank you.